Good morning. Uh, this is the lecture presentation for Unit 6, Principles of Management at Newberry College in fall of 2021. I'm Professor Marsh. We'll be working with uh, uh, Chapter 6 in the 10th edition of our textbook, which is uh, uh, Chapter 6 in the 11th, uh, I'm sorry, Chapter 7 in the 11th edition of the textbook. Uh, they are substantially identical, and I will point out any important differences in the materials. Uh, so for Unit 6, uh, we had the uh, uh, learning objectives uh, and the six key elements in organizational design, uh, contingency factors that favor either the mechanistic model or the organic model. We'll get into how to define those various models. Uh, traditional and contemporary organizational designs, and we'll also look at design challenges faced by uh, today's managers and organizations. Uh, and again, Chapter 6 in the 10th edition and Chapter 7 in the 11th edition, uh, with just the updating of a few examples uh, that don't really matter, the two editions are nearly identical. Uh, the learning outcomes that are presented in the chapter are identical in all respects. So let's look at the first uh, learning objective, six key elements in organizational design. Uh, and let's just go through them and list them. So uh, we have work specialization is the first, departmentalization is the second, authority and responsibility is the third, span of control is the fourth, centralization and decentralization uh, is the uh, fifth aspect or element in organizational design, and formalization is the sixth. Now that's a lot of zations, isn't it? Uh, the objective of your design, though, is relatively simple, uh, getting work done efficiently and effectively. So let's, look at, let's review a few of the definitions here. Uh, organizing. Uh, we're, we're into the material on organize, organizing now. We're out of planning. Uh, that's the function of management in which the organization structure is created. Uh, organizational design. Uh, this is where managers develop or change the organization structure. Work specialization, our first element. Uh, this is dividing work activities into separate jobs, uh, also called division of labor. You've probably heard that term before. Well, this is what it means. Uh, note that the graph that shows diminishing returns uh, from too much work specialization, so you have to get you have to define and divide uh, the units of work appropriately. If you get too specialized, you're going to have too much passing around, and efficiency will suffer. Uh, also, too much division of labor can create human diseconomies, boredom, stress, fatigue, low morale from repetitive tasks. Uh, this has been classic throughout America's uh, modernization in uh, the... Uh, industrial movement uh, that began in the late 19th century, continuing through uh, the 20th century. Uh, picture the classic old I Love Lucy. Now, you might not know about this, but this, uh, there, this was actually illustrated in a, a, a groundbreaking television show, uh, Lucille Ball, uh, I Love Lucy. And this is where Lucy and Ethel, uh, the characters, go to work at a candy factory. Uh, uh, or you could take a look at one of the old Charlie Chaplin movies from the 1930s. So uh, uh, I Love Lucy was in the 1950s. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, another comedian, Charlie Chaplin, uh, did a movie called Modern Times. And both of these show the production line uh, and the alienation of, and uh, boredom and uh, just the horrible treatment of workers on the production line uh, who have to do the same tasks over and over again like a robot. And, of course, today uh, a lot of these tasks are performed by robots. Uh, I've posted links uh, in my materials. If you look at the PowerPoint slides uh, and look at the notes to the PowerPoint slides, you have to turn on the function that allows you to read my notes, and they're there for you to read for every chapter. Uh, and so it may be, may be uh, repetitive uh, for you to uh, see what I'm saying uh, uh, on the screen and then also see what I'm saying uh, in the text, but uh, you can watch both 
uh, presumably at uh, the same time, or you can print out my, my spiel. But uh, in your notes uh, for this uh, particular chapter, uh, there is a link to a YouTube video which actually has the old I Love Lucy show that shows her working uh, on the candy line. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a very funny bit, uh, but it also, like uh, a lot of good comedy, uh, has a satire with a point. Uh, and uh, the point is uh, that uh, uh, the production line uh, can be a very difficult place to work uh, and uh, maybe not worth the extra money uh, you bring in from that sort of a job. And then also the Charlie Chaplin uh, bit in modern times, and it's strikingly similar, uh, even though he's making some sort of uh, industrial product, not candy, uh, how similar uh, the, uh, the comedy is. It's, it's basically the same gag uh, and done brilliantly by two of the greatest comic actors of all time. Uh, so uh, Lucille Ball in the 50s, Charlie Chaplin in the 1930s, uh, and uh, uh, both of them working on a poorly designed production line uh, with bosses who only knew how to s increase the speed of the line regardless of the effect it has on the workers doing these meaningless, repetitive tasks. Um, and, and as I mentioned a while ago, technology has uh, replaced a lot of these tasks uh, as robotics, uh, permit dark factories uh, to assemble without human involvement. Uh, I have a client who has a dark factory that makes uh, cabinetry, uh, and they can uh, turn on the machines and leave uh, for the weekend, and when they get back, they'll have more cabinets, uh, and uh, or partially finished cabinets that uh, uh, there is a little bit of involvement in uh, doing the finish work. Uh, but uh, today, maybe Lucy or Charlie uh, couldn't get their factory jobs, but they could get a job in sales. Uh, you have to worry about sales, and the uh, you know you get hired for sales, you end up uh, uh, you know in a, a telephone boiler room or something like that, uh, or learn to code, uh, which can also be repetitive and boring uh, today. But of course, computers are learning pretty quickly how to sell and code themselves. Uh, so maybe Lucy and Charlie should just stay at Newberry College uh, and become managers. Uh, good idea. Uh, note the definition of departmentalization, how groups are, gr how jobs are grouped together, and five different types of departmentalization in the second exhibit uh, in the chapter. Functional, product, customer, uh, geographic, and process departmentalization. Note the modern trend to create cross-functional work teams. A lot of businesses do this now. Teams that are made up of individuals from different departments, uh, these can be useful in work tasks that require diverse skills and viewpoints, especially as businesses become more complex. Authority and responsibility. Authority uh, refers to the rights inherent in a managerial position to give orders and expect the orders to be obeyed. So what's the, a classic example of that? Uh, might be the uh, Jack Nicholson character, uh, Colonel Jessup, in the movie A Few Good Men. We follow orders or people die. That's the viewpoint of the U.S. Marine Corps at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. Uh, that's perhaps the extreme uh, iconic example. Uh, and there's also in these notes a link to that scene, uh, if you'd like to watch it again. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's worth watching. In fact, the whole, uh, the whole movie uh, is... Uh, is, is a great uh, a great show. Uh, the U.S. Marines have a, cheer, a clear chain of command, and the colonel, who's the commanding officer at a military base giving an order to the men on base, has plenty of authority on his base. But a trial lawyer conducting a cross-examination of that same colonel in a court-martial has the authority to ask questions uh, of that officer uh, that the men on base and questions of that order also that the men on base didn't have. And that's un unless the judge rules the question out of order. The Marines and the court system have clear chains of command. So do some businesses, although some are less structured. And that's what this chapter is about. Responsibility is an obligation to perform assigned duties, uh, usually but not always found down the chain of command. 
Uh, note the differences in traditional organizational charts uh, presented as the third exhibit in the chapter between line authority, which is top down from level to level, line authority, and staff authority, uh, positions that may be or out to the side here, positions with some authority that have been created to support, assist, and advise those holding the line authority. Uh, for example, the general counsel or the internal auditor in a company would be examples of individuals with staff authority. Uh, let's move on to uh, contingency variables and structural choice. Uh, and we'll look uh, at both mechanistic and organic structures. So what, what are we talking about here? Uh, mechanistic structures tend to look like pyramids or, you know, maybe, you know, a tall office building. Uh, climbing the corporate ladder, uh, they can be rigid and hierarchical. Uh, they tend to be uh, very traditional. Um, it's in, in the, uh, uh, there are some companies that started out with this sort of organization and have become more organic over time. That's what this part of the this section of the book discusses. Typically there are fixed duties, many rules, formalized communication, centralized authority, uh, and they tend to be what uh, designers call taller. They have many more levels uh, of uh, management and responsibility. Uh, you might think of a bank in which uh, you know you have the uh, uh, the frontline workers, the uh, tellers, and then uh, you know perhaps you have people up on the platform uh, who have uh, uh, some more authority. Maybe customer service representatives who are either equal to or perhaps slightly above the tellers, uh, and then above that uh, you might have a, a level of assistant vice presidents, vice presidents, executive vice presidents, senior executive vice presidents, uh, and uh, then the C-suite uh, of all your uh, chief this and chief that, you know, chief operating officer, executive officer, information officer, and so on. So uh, that's, uh, that's the mechanistic uh, structure. Then you can have an organic structure, which tends to be uh, more collaborative, both horizontally and vertically. So uh, uh, usually wider and not not so tall, flatter, uh, with uh, you know horizontal and vertical bands. But uh, they tend to be relatively short uh, chains uh, between the uh, levels <coughs> of communication. Uh, organic structures tend to have adaptable duties, uh, fewer rules. If you were to picture them. Uh, they look more like a pond. Uh, uh, there's typically informal uh, communication and more communication uh, within the organization. Uh, less giving of rules and more of posting information. Uh, decentralized authority uh, and uh, again the, stru the structure you might think of more as uh, you know a, a pond or a huddle or uh, a moibus strip uh, or uh, Watch out for a mosh pit. Now, some, somewhere around here, I have a Moebius strip, and I, I, I don't, don't know, or Mobius, perhaps you might you might call it. Uh, not sure what I have done with it. Perhaps I knocked it down uh, somehow. But in any event, uh, uh, if I don't do it in this lecture, uh, I will show you uh, a uh, Mobius strip uh, in the next. It's uh, it's an interesting. Uh, physical structure. It's it's one in which uh, uh, if you trace your way around the strip uh, without ever having to uh, uh, lift your pen, uh, you will cover. Uh, you will uh, you you will touch each surface, uh, each each surface, uh, even you know the front and the back, uh, in a complete loop uh, without ever having to lift uh, your pen. It's it's rather uh, fascinating structure and and it's the sort of structure that might uh, uh, you know be an inspiration uh, for uh, organizational design uh, as all of the uh, all of the surfaces are connected uh, without uh, having to uh, you know get on an elevator and uh, visit the next one uh, so there's a multimedia looking presentation of the material uh, this material in your book uh, which seeks to not only present the outline of the concepts, but it also gives you a visual representation. 
And, and I think this is a very effective way to introduce the concept of structure, uh, which frankly, in most startups, happens organically. Uh, mechanistic structures are what we think of as the traditional corporate form. Uh, the, uh, uh, you'll see graphic examples of typical organizational charts for this sort of structure later in the chapter. Uh, note that even mechanistic structures can be adapted using cross-departmental work teams and special units to respond to dynamic environmental changes and competitive situations. You might have a mechanistic structure overall, but then at the same time you might have some of the members of those groups work together in special project teams uh, to address uh, some important uh, project or situation. Uh, organic structures are typically smaller ventures uh, or in larger companies organized so that the work team is interdisciplinary uh, and is the basic unit of the company with a very short path from work team to senior top management. Organic structures work best in the very dynamic industries such as high tech, marketing, and highly creative and innovative industries. And uh, note the if then. Uh, the logical design of your material, and the four key variables. So the four contingency variables affecting structure are strategy, size, technology, and the environment. Uh, for strategy, uh, look at the work of Alfred Chandler, which is cited in the book. Uh, uh, goals are an important part of an organization's strategy. Uh, structure should facilitate goal achievement. Uh, if you have a simple strategy, you can have a simple structure. If you have a complex strategy, uh, you might need a complex structure. Uh, you don't get to add additional players just to run a flea flicker uh, in football, a very complex play. Uh, you just need to make sure that each player carries out his or her assignment or the play is going to collapse. Some strategies favor uh, mechanistic uh, like cost control, uh, picture Walmart. Uh, some strategies favor organic structures like innovation, uh, picture Apple or Facebook. Uh, size can determine structure. Uh, note in the book the magic number of 2,000 employees. Above 2,000, you need more mechanistic structures. However, not all the time, like Apple or Facebook. Uh, less than 2,000 employees, and there doesn't seem to be a problem in staying relatively organic. I remember one time meeting Hugh McCall, who is the longtime CEO and chairman of Bank of America, and the story goes back to a time when it was NCNB or Nations Bank uh, before uh, they uh, acquired Bank of America. And uh, uh, what Hugh McCall told me uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, his taking on some, I think, political responsibility. He was supporting a candidate uh, for office for whom I was the treasurer. Uh, and uh, uh, Hugh explained that uh, he didn't have the time to do that. Maybe he was just being polite. Uh, but he said, you know, as the CEO and chairman uh, of the bank uh, back then, he already had 25,000 employees to worry about. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's, that's really was his primary focus. Uh, banks typically have mechanistic structures, although certain work teams, uh, M&A, investment banking, uh, marketing, international, new product development, they're, they're less heavily regulated and less burdened by reporting requirements and administrative needs. And so they can operate more organically. Technology determines structure. Um, technology is used by every organization to convert inputs into outputs. Uh, note the box that shows the research and the work of the British management scholar Joan Woodward who analyzed the importance of technology in organizational structure. Organizations that produce units one at a time or in small batches uh, typically are organized organically. As the organization begins to use technology to permit mass production or even continuous production lines uh, called uh, process production by your book, 
they typically needed to reorganize to a mechanistic structure. Uh, and I can recall many social critics from comedians like Charlie Chaplin and Lucille Ball to writers like Kurt Vonnegut who decried the mechaniz mechanization of the human in production line industries. Uh, many of the large unions in the United States have their birth in the alienation, boredom, health problems, both physical and mental injuries, that can result from human beings having to work in repetitive motion production lines. It can be soul-killing work. Job shops tend to suit artisans and creative types. Mass production lines seem to suit the managers and engineers who design them, but the workers often feel as though they are just additional cogs in the wheel. Modern production lines today often reorganize duties so that they are performed not with repetitive motions, but by highly trained workers individually or in small teams who have time to craft a section of the product and use their expertise to assure quality work on each item before it goes down the line to the next station. Environment can determine structure too. Uh, last but not least, stable environments favor mechanistic, mechanistic organizations. Dynamic organizations respond to change better, and so that favors organic structures. So what are common organizational designs? Um, you have some traditional ones. You have simple structures, uh, fast, flexible, inexpensive, and accountable but hard to maintain as you grow and over-reliant on key personnel. Uh, you can have functional structures, uh, cost savings from specialization and economies of scale, uh, but you can have blinders. Uh, managers can protect the turf of their you know, department at the expense of the organization. And divisional structures, their results-oriented. Uh, division managers uh, accountable for results uh, but you can have uh, duplication and inefficiency. Note all the definitions in the margins and the graphical examples of different types of structures in this section. Note that even extremely large organizations, uh, such as the W.L. Gore manufacturing firm, uh, they developed and made the revolutionary fiber Gore-Tex, uh, which all you athletes have benefited from even as uh, knockoffs and other competitors have improved and overtaken the market, you may see I've got my Under Armour on here, uh, has, uh, so, but the Gore Company has organized its 9,000 employees into relatively autonomous, self-managed, cross-functional work teams that do business in 30 countries around the world. Uh, this is in the 10th edition. Uh, in the 11th edition, they, this is where they give the whole... Whole Foods as an example of work teams. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but that's an improvement uh, in the book, uh, and I'm not sure about that example in practice. Uh, I don't know that the deli guy uh, consults with the checkout gal at Whole Foods to jointly serve customer needs the way work teams do uh, in uh, making and marketing Gore-Tex. Uh, note the definition in your book for traditional structures, uh, uh, but also uh, the evolving uh, new ones. Uh, like team structure, uh, that's Gore-Tex, the entire organization is made up of work teams. Uh, matrix structure, uh, that's uh, the organization is designed like Keanu Reeves. No, 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 that's not right. Okay, specialists from different functional departments are assigned to work on projects led by a product, I'm sorry, a project manager. Uh, by the way, businesses are always, always, always looking for experienced project managers. If you need a job uh, and you're in business, uh, you know, just look through the want ads and see for yourself. Now, how do you get to be a project manager? Well, that is you go to work for an organization uh, that has a team or matrix structure and you work on a bunch of work teams and eventually you'll be asked to lead one. Uh, maybe when the person uh, who's leading one is on vacation. Uh, so that's how you become an experienced project manager. Uh, it is a very uh, good uh, middle management uh, type job uh, and can pay quite well. Uh, my uh, wife, uh, who worked in consulting for Ernst & Young for many years, is an experienced project manager. Uh, and if she wanted a job, uh, she could have it. Uh, uh, it's 8.48 in the morning right now. She could have one by 8.49. 
uh, if she wanted to go back to work and do that. Uh, project structure, a structure in which employees continuously work on projects. A boundaryless organization, an organization whose design is not defined by or limited to a pre-designed structure. A virtual organization, an organization that consists of a small core of full-time employees uh, aided by specialists uh, temporarily hired to work as needed on projects. Interestingly, uh, this culture has some of its roots in the film industry out in Hollywood. As specialists in all the technical areas, uh, you know, uh, set design and uh, makeup and, and uh, uh, you know, sound and, and electricians, uh, as well as many, if not most, of the actors are not employees but independent contractors uh, brought together by the production companies to work on jobs one project at a time, one film at a time. Um, some law firms have become virtual organi organizations, and in fact our law firm is in the process uh, of moving to uh, what we hope uh, we will be able to find a virtual office uh, that allows us to uh, work at home, so, so I'll be a Newberry even more uh, than I currently am, uh, and, uh, uh, but also uh, be able to get back to the uh, mothership, uh, to the home office, uh, which uh, will have a shared conference room uh, with other uh, virtual offices in the building and allow us to meet with clients who need to have a sit-down meeting uh, to uh, sign documents, typically, is what uh, we lawyers need to do uh, in the office. Uh, network organization, that's an organization that uses its own employees to do some work activities and a network of outside suppliers to fill in the gaps, providing other needed product components or work processes. Uh, now, contemporary organizational designs can include team structure, uh, matrix pro project structure, boundaryless structure, and uh, learning structure, which is a relatively new uh, dynamic. Uh, I've already discussed a lot of this uh, and the important material uh, for this and going through the other structures uh, because <coughs> frankly even the ones that have traditional structures are becoming more hybrid and are adding uh, contemporary features. But uh, note the learning structure which is actually part of the last learning objective for the chapter. Uh, it's an organization as presented in the book with one, a boundaryless organizational design, open, timely, and accurate, accurate information sharing among team members. That's important that you have good communication. <coughs> Collaborative leadership with a shared vision throughout the team and an organizational tr culture with a strong mutual relationship, with strong mutual relationships, a sense of community, caring, and trust. It's a little bit like a study group that works on products and services for an organization. Okay, now the last objective, today's organizational design challenges, uh, ending the chapter. So uh, the ones that the book identifies are keeping employees connected, <coughs> global differences, and building a learning organization. Uh, the most important challenges in organizational design today as they've been in other aspects of management uh, we've studied uh, this semester re revolve around the revolution in information, technology, and communications, permitting flexible work arrangements as well as demographic changes with employees valuing and in some cases demanding such fle flexibility. Uh, compressed work weeks, flex time, job sharing, and contingent workers are all part of this trend. Um, so in this unit, uh, we've looked at the key elements in organizational design. We've looked at the factors that favor traditional mechanistic design and organic design. We've looked at many examples of traditional and contemporary organization designs and identified some of the companies and industries that use each. And, and there's a, a rich set of materials with, uh, uh, you know, photographs in, in each of the editions that uh, have have good examples of, of how some of these major companies uh, are organized. <clears throat> and we've discussed the contemporary challenges facing managers in organizational design. Uh, in our next unit, Unit 7, we'll look at the very touchy and highly regulated issues of HR, human resource management, uh, so we'll get a little personnel uh, 
That's a, if your dad was a manager, that would be one of his jokes. Uh, sorry about that. We'll see you next time. Uh, have a great day.